Margie Dunn, thank you so much for having me into your office at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's headquarters here in Rockville, Maryland. Oh, you're welcome. Well, this is my office, and um, I'm really pleased to be able to talk with uh, your listeners, but also I'm hoping my staff will be interested in this as well. Well, I, I mean, there's a lot that I want to talk to you about. You know, hearing your speech at the Wins Dinner a few months ago, incredibly inspirational. But before we get to the content of that and all the great work that you do here, I'd just love to hear a little bit more about your life story, how you got into the space to begin with. Yeah, so I think I'm, you're never going to hear this story again. It's very unique. I, was, um, I came out of law school, and I really just wanted to help. So I went to work at the uh, Department of Veterans of Field, uh, Department of Veterans Appeals, and um, I was looking at all kinds of different issues with veterans that were trying to um, appeal denial of benefits. Well, and, where did this come from, though? We're going to do a little armchair psychology for a yeah. second. What? Not everyone has that mindset. Hey, I want to help other people. A lot of people are like, once they get out of school, I just want to do whatever's best for me. Where did? that come from? I think it came from growing up in a family of eight kids and also being of, um, we're Italian. And so we had a very community based, um, I'd say I had a very community based childhood mm. where when something happened in not just my family, but I have tons of cousins. So you can imagine there are these eight kids and um, and we were very rascally. We were, there were eight kids in 10 years. So we lived as a community in the house and you had to, there are all kinds of um, informal rules and things like that, but but we always had each other's back. My parents would always, uh, they would always say, you know, reward behavior when you were helping out your 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 sisters and brothers or putting them first. So that became very early on as a child, I got rewarded when I was helping and you know being of assistance. But then more than that, we would always jump in. That's how the community worked. And then my neighbors were the same way. So we, I don't know whether it was my family that started it, and my parents were. Um, they started what now I think has been um, the recreational programs, that after-school recreational programs out in the suburbs. My parents came from the city. They were boys and girls clubs. They saw that kids were getting in trouble. And yeah. so they started something called Drop-In. And then the county took over doing these after-school programs. And now you have like recreation centers. There was nothing like that. So Wow, what amazing think, examples. Yeah, so I think, I, I think it's from my upbringing. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so uh, now you're at, um, which department was this? this was with Veterans? Yes, the Board of Veterans Appeals. Yes. And um, because my grandfather, as far as I can remember, my grandfather, my father, my brother, they were, they, my brother was in the military at the time. They were all veterans. And so mm. I thought this was a good place to really yeah. add value. And um, so I worked at the Veterans Appeals and I, it, it was a great job. Um, it was challenging because as a woman, it, it, it raised, it, they didn't have a real program for when you um, had children. So that yeah. was a struggle. I was working to help, you know, maybe improve the um, environment for women who had children. But um, when I had my second daughter, she was ill. And so I couldn't keep going downtown mm. um, because I had to, uh, she had to get medical attention. Mm. So I talked to a friend of mine who, whose father worked at the, at here at, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And she said, hey, they have, um, there's a, a temporary job, temporary job that I could get in the office of the secretary, okay. which is a great office, but it is not doing legal work. So I would leave a permanent legal job to go to a temporary job. So the head of that office, um, it was not her father. He talked to me. He was so excited because he was going to get an attorney to work and he'd always wanted it. Um, but he told me it would be the dumbest thing I ever did. That he used those words. <laughs> Don't do it. But in my mind, I had a sick daughter. I needed to make some change. I needed to get closer to home. And I was going to I was going to have to stop working if I, I didn't find some solution to wow. our family environment. So I thought, well, I don't really know much about nuclear. And I wasn't sure that this was an area where I wanted to put my focus. Anyway, they offered me the temporary job and I took it uh, for a while. I thought they put me in for six months. Um, they gave me six months, a detail for six months and um, oh, not a detail, but a temporary job mm. um, for six months. And I thought, what? Well, six months to find another job in this area would be fine. I'll, I'll be fine. I'll land on my feet or I just got to really concentrate on my daughter. And as I go forward in my career, I'm always trying to tell uh, women, you know, 
don't think you can't step back and, and do different things because you can. It took me a mm. long time to get to the job that I'm in now. And I tell women and men, parents or, you know, however you're coming at the issues, that's why I feel so strongly about that. I've made yeah. a lot of big changes and taken a lot of risks and they've worked out. So anyway, that's how I came to nuclear. I came in the office of the secretary. I, it just so happened. I got lucky. Um, they had just uh, abolished an appeal board. So they had just a, a, a board that mm. would be reviewing um, decisions, licensing decisions, and then the appeal would go right to the commission. And there used to be an appeal board. They had abolished it. So I studied all the new regulations and became the expert on the new regulations. And Wait got a minute. Up. You, so there was something inside of you that kind of drove you to put in that extra, extra work to learn just as much as you could. So, it, it, I mean, so there's a couple of themes that I'm pulling in here. This risk taking, which is one that I heard about before from you, which, uh, which is what, you know, it's like, oh my God, I got to talk to her more about this. But then also, um, there's a curiosity there. There's a, a drive to do the extra, you know, put in the extra mile, you know, do the extra work. And that paid off. Yeah. Yeah. That paid off. Yeah. So the, I think um, I probably should digress a little bit. So my house, in my house, I said we were kind of rascally, but it was more than that. When I was growing up, if we found a bug, we were intellectually curious about everything. Mm. My brothers and sisters were amazing. They would read things. We'd all share it. We read each other's stories. My sister illustrated The Hobbit for me when I was young because she's a beautiful artist. And it, right. So we, we were just intellectually curious. And so we would find a bug outside and my mother would call a local university if we couldn't identify it. We actually Get found, out of here. yes, yes. And so we actually found a, an insect that, yeah. So, so I, so it was fun for me this intellectual curiosity. We were also avid sports fans. We played sports. My dad was a big athlete and um, his name is Ben Calandrio. He, there's lots of things that are written about him. He was a big athlete in DC, so we were avid sports fans. So then I became really competitive too. So the drive comes from an intellectual curiosity, but also if I'm going to do the job, I'm going to do it like the best ever. Yeah. You know? And so I, I played college sports. What And what sport was it? I played field hockey and lacrosse. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, we were better at lacrosse. We we went, I played in um, several NCAA tournaments. You must have met, so I, I grew up on Long Island, uh, another yeah. big lacrosse town. So it's yeah. Maryland, Long Island. Yeah, Those are like so the breeding absolutely. grounds for lacrosse players. You must have yeah. met a bunch of um, oh my, my brethren out there. One of them was from Long Island. Just amazing. Yeah, we had, <laughs> we had incredible athletes from New Jersey and Long Island. And so you picked Baltimore. up all of this knowledge as the, um, as the agency itself was uh, transforming. What did it look like during that period? And what role did you play? You know, it was... Um, you know, sometimes I think about what are the similarities between now and then and, and what can we do, what can we mimic that worked back then? And mm. I think we were transforming because um, shortly after, so I, so when I had that position, we were transforming because of the appeal board and we were streamlining our licensing process. And, and it has, this has always resonated with me and I have communicated this since I've become um, the EDO is EDO. I'm going to make you break out all acronyms. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. I'm <laughs> terrible about that. That's a whole other joke is like we use acronyms for everything. Um, executive director for operations. So I'm on the operations side. This is the first time in my career I'm on the operations side. I mean, you're, side. you're the head honcho here for the day-to-day -day running the whole place. You're yes, the head honcho. Yes, yes, yes. So the commission though, they, they, they feel like, you know, they're the board. They're the, they're the ones that, that are the head of honchos for setting all the policy. I'm implementing, yes, but I'm I'm implementing it over the staff. And there are some commission offices that report uh, directly to the commission and not to me. But but most of the offices, right, report directly under me. I have wonderful people working um, as executives, but all the way down to to the staff. And I never forget that. I'm so humbled by this position because it is it's a very big job. And coming back to that theme of risks, I mean, there were risks that you had to take along the way to get here. Oh yeah, yeah. This job is the biggest risk <laughs> because it wasn't in my, you know, wasn't how I had um, progressed through my career. I was always on. So I well, tell I was, us about that. Yeah, draw where, the comparison for us. Yeah. So I was always on what would be, I would say, the policy side and what, what I'm going to call support. If you want to think of the lawyers as supporting the technical decisions as opposed to making them. Um, so I was always on that side. So I. Um, and I'd say in the Office of International Programs, maybe I was a little in between uh, because we had licensing. We actually did export import licensing for the United States for, for um, civilian equipment. The NRC is responsible for most of the um, nuclear equipment uh, exports. And how, how does that work? 
who buys nuclear export equipment from the U.S. to another country? What, oh, what's how does that work? So it's um, it's kind of it's it's fascinating. So in my opinion, I thought it was really great because it tied into my legal career. I had wanted to go to international law, and so when I got into international export import licensing, I was like, yes, I get to use a lot of these things that I learned about, like you know, the Non Proliferation Treaty and what the framework is. So. Nuclear exports, I'm not going to go into, we, we'd need like three days to go over this because it's so... Um, I got time. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'll, I'll do that at high level. Then you ask me questions in case I'm not, I'm not specific enough. But basically, when you're doing nuclear exports, you have to make sure that whoever you're giving it to is agreeing to use it in the same way. Obviously, you don't want it to fall mm. into the wrong hands, but you also want it to be used safely and securely. So um, that's promoting, you know, the issues that are... Or, or it, it's going to be used for for its intended purpose, and so um, so there are two kinds of exports. There are sources and materials that get exported, but there's also uh, reactors. Mm. Whole reactors can be exported, and, and the equipment that goes along with the reactors. And depending what it is, the material or the equipment, and, and it's mainly the security concerns and all the, the safety concerns. It has more and more process on it whether you can actually transfer it. So every a lot of people have heard about one, two, three agreements. Mm -hmm. So those are necessary if, you, if it's a reactor, but those aren't necessary if it's a, a source, what's necessary for most source material, some, but, but most. And what's a source? Some. A source so is? A source would be um, something that uses radioactive material to um, th that you might use in an industry or something mm -hmm. like that. So for example, there are sources that you use to take um, x-rays of buildings to make sure that there aren't cracks in them. And so, so it's something that a, has some ra radiation characteristics to it that you can yeah, use for measurement or inspection or, or pictures or that's right. And sometimes that's right. It's used for measurement or all kinds of different things, but also can't forget it's also used in, in, in um, the medical field, right? To diagnose. Mm. Uh, most people know that, you know, it's used to diagnose um, uh, cancers and all kinds of different things, but it's also, so it's used for diagnostic, but also to treat cancer. So all of these things have to have to be regulated one way or another. But when we export, we we make sure, so we, we think about exporting as kind of a chain. And, and what you want to make sure is that there's no weak link in that chain, mm. because otherwise all of the efforts that you make to secure material and, and to make sure that it's used safely will be broken down by that one weak link. So that's how exporting works, really. You're going to that country and making sure they have strong export. And you need an agency like the NRC to keep track of this because you can't just trust uh, some company in some country to just sign a piece of paper and say, oh, we promise we'll take care of it. There's got to be some vetting that goes on. There's got to be... Right. right. So you would want to know that in that country, there someone is the government has committed to not letting this. So let's take the hardest thing, right? Nuclear materials that could be used in a weapon, right? Mm. So you want to make sure that that government is committed to all of the same non-proliferation, uh, the non-proliferation regime and making sure that this material is handled appropriately. So you want to make sure that it's the government that's, and the government's giving you assurances that it is making sure that it has a process for licensing like the United States has. So it is Private entrepreneurs can use this. You would want them to, right? It's the benefit of society. But you want to make sure that the government has committed to make sure that it's used properly. It's not going to fall in the right hands. So a lot of our conversations, a lot of the um, treaties, a lot of the obligations and assurances that it's going to be used are actually from the government. But then the government licensed individuals. So the transaction is between individuals. Mm, got it. Yeah, so it's complicated. That I makes it very complex, but... Good thing you were studying so hard to yeah, pick up yeah. on all of it. Well, and I had great staff when I was working in, in international programs. And then, so how did your career progress from there? So um, so I came in the agency in the office of the secretary. I learn all these roles, and I get picked up by a new office. It just was so, like, was a lot of, it, it, people say luck has a lot to do with it. It really does. So they were starting a new opinion writing office. I had been opinion writing at the Board of Veterans Appeals. I got picked up into this new office. That's how I, I got a legal job. And in fact, I got it so quickly in the agency that the office of the secretary didn't want to let me go. And I said, are you <laughs> kidding? This is a temporary job. I need a full-time job. So they, they worked it out. And I finally got over. I became a lawyer. I went to work in a commissioner's office. I worked um, for uh, around, I think, over seven years for Commissioner Merrifield. Yeah, Merrifield, yeah. the former Titan on the show. <laughs> yes. So I worked for him. And I, I was his legal assistant, then his chief of staff. And then I got into the SES program, the Senior Executive Service okay, um, Development you. Program. And uh, once I was certified, I went to the Office of uh, International Programs. I was the uh, deputy director, and that's when I did the export-import licensing, and mm. then the director. 
Wow. And so from there, um, I had a lot of executive experience and my negotiation skills got so much better because um, it turns out that lawyers, there's actually a textbook my daughter showed me, lawyers don't make good diplomats. Ooh. So because lawyers want to win. <laughs> And, so, right. and what you learn in, in, in an international process is you, you have to negotiate and you need to understand, you know, the, the interests of others and really to get. get and who issue. are you negotiating like with to... in that role? Oh, so um, it depends. Uh, it depends on what the issues are. But I think the most important negotiations that I ever did in my career, and I doubt anything will ever top this, is is uh, Fukushima happened while mm. I was the director of international programs. And it was around 2011. 2011. So the first thing that happened was, you know, sort of a policymakers at the highest levels of the government trying to figure out who's, you know, who should the U.S. support. And- I can imagine. It's almost like how, um, like the European Union works, where it's like they might get together in one room, but then they got to go back to the countries, and then the countries have to be approving things, and then it's got to go back to the main body. I can imagine there's a lot of, well, why do we have to listen to the international organization? We've got you know, sovereign yeah. rights as our own countries. Right. Which are the countries that are most different than the U.S. in that oh, respect? Gosh, that's that's a most different, and I always think like most interesting. Maybe um, I'll make you answer that so one. So I think I think that some of the voices that were giving us new information that we weren't really thinking about were the non-nuclear countries. Mm. And so, for example, I remember Singapore at the time was raising a great issue about you know you you know try to take into consideration or take into consideration how it feels to be in a region where you don't have nuclear, but you're affected by it. How are they affected by it? Yeah. So they would be affected by it in their, if there were transboundary effects from the radiation. So that didn't happen. Transboundary effects. Oh, you mean like radionuclides moving around the world. And so some of the voices that were coming from those countries were, were, perspectives that we weren't thinking about. Mm. So I thought that that was really interesting. So some of the, and, and especially the countries that were over in Asia, because they felt really, um, you know, scared at the time they were trying to get information. They felt, wow. so they were trying to help us do a, not just look at how do you make the plant safe, but also how do you do better communication? How do you, you know, make sure that they have a voice? How do you help them with their emergency planning if they ever had to have it, you know, different things like that. So it brought in the issues in a, you know, proper way. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, there's something, uh, the Europeans were coming at the issues their way, and that was tough for us because we had to make sure that we we weren't really involved in that decision making. But when it came in, we had to make sure that it was consistent with how we would approach issues. And so none of us, at a fundamental level, everybody agreed. Mm. But and how to say it, there were a lot of yeah. back and forth. I can't even, so, you know, I, I can't, that's hard to describe. So, so how did you do it then? Did you take off your competitive lawyer hat and put on your diplomat hat? Or do you try to, do you try to build, do you try to work the diplomat skills into your everyday life? How did you, you know, tr- transformation is going to be a theme of this talk, but how did you like personally transform yourself to become a better diplomat? Okay. So I, worked on that. And luckily, luckily I had had a couple years before Fukushima and, and because I'd been in OIP for many years at that point. And, and it's exactly that, you know, it's looking for, you know, you're in that big family, that scrum of eight kids and you know, you're not going to get your way. And especially I was six of eight. So you had to be pretty clever <laughs> to put a win-win in if you were going to get to watch the Brady Bunch. And, you know, another brother or sister wanted to watch, you know, a horror film later at night. It was like, well, you support me and your, my decision, I'll support you. So you really, I had to go back to that kind of feeling of um, not everybody wins, but that I understood, I heard. Empathy building. And definitely. So sometimes we would talk to different, you know, different partners to try to, so diplomacy became, um, one, it was use your energy in the right way. And it's not fighting. It's go and try to find out the issues, try to find out win wins, and then bring it back to get a solution. And don't be so competitive that you have. If you had five things that you have to get all five, know when to stop fighting and know when you've won. Yeah. You know, and so you really, if you think about those things in in, in advance, you you tend to, I, I think, you're better on your feet. And the empathy building. I mean, you if you could have seen Japan and in, in that environment, you just it it was. Yeah. They were close um, cooperation partners with us. We knew them all. Um, they came. You had a lot of friends there. How did um yeah, yeah. and it they were very um humble and embarrassed and yeah 
and you wanted to be serious about addressing the issues, but not keep pushing on. But now we can feel even worse. But yeah, because what good was that? We had to we had to be productive. Right. So over the course of the next few years, um, how did the conversation change? Let's say leading up to 2016 and you know in your new role and what, what did it look like on the world stage? I think the I think the biggest thing so so we had to decide after Fukushima whether there was going to be a change to the convention. And this became really contentious. There were people on, on both sides. And, and we decided, and the reason why you wouldn't want to just change a convention is because it's hard to ratify, to make into a law. And the U.S. has taken years and years. And then you would have some people who ratified this version and this version, and, this, and, and, and it's, a, it's a peer review document. And so um, I wasn't, then I went to the office of the general counsel. I became the general counsel. And all of a sudden, my role took on this, okay, how legally could we do something else, a statement, and ended up being the Vienna Declaration? How can we do mm. a statement and make some difference? And so that was my transition. It was really interesting because it was a legal issue that that came from the international programs. And, and I started to um, move away from the international, move into the domestic, and really uh, start thinking about um, where the agency needed to go because the Renaissance. So when I was in the Office of International Programs, we were thinking we were going to build plants in this country and we right. were going to sell plants overseas. And this is where we were going. We built an international cooperation program. My staff built an international cooperation program for new reactors that we had never had before. We were just building and moving. And then 2011 happens. And then shortly after 2012, I go to the general counsel's office. We're working. We work this statement. And that's pretty much the last work I did in international, now I'm turning domestic. And right. the issues in domestic are now everything's going down. And it's a very challenging time for the agency. Everything's going down. This is because we thought we were going to have this uh, this renaissance. Exactly. And so there was all of this buildup and right. there was investment. There was people exactly. investment. There was program investment. Right. Building, whole building, building three here. And then when the um, economy dried up a bit in 2008. The contracts didn't manifest itself like we expected. I mean, there were going to be like 30 new plants right, or something. Right, right, And so now all of this buildup, all this buildup, and now it's and like... And then Fukushima. And then Fukushima it's like, on it's top like, of it. Okay, oh, aye, so, aye. Right, so, this industry is the worst lock. Yeah, I know. The timing, it's <laughs> wow. like... Yeah. It's, but it's like been the same so, thing. Like throughout history, it's like economic... Like even in the 70s, you know, leading into the 80s, it was like economic issues, Three Mile <laughs> Island... You know, and then it's like leading up to 2011, you know, economic, you know, like going to raise economic issues, Fukushima. Right. Right. Significant like economic lock. issues in the United States. Then you have Fukushima. Yes. So, um, so right. So things were turning. And so in the, so one of the biggest, um, I think two things that happened. So all of a sudden everything's focused on waste. Yeah. I get into the mm. office of the general counsel and we lose this very big case called waste confidence. And that's where the NRC used to say, used to, because we changed everything. But we used to say, we're confident that there's going to be a waste disposal. And in between storage of waste, we'll be fine. We got challenged and we had had these five findings and the court threw out several of the findings, not all of them, but threw out several of the findings. So when I came into the general counsel's office, there was a lot of, um, there was a push by, an, uh, there was a judge um, at the, at the, um, board, the NRC board, um, that he had said, well, why don't you just take a, a, a different, take, uh, throw out the way that you're doing it and just do this as an environmental impact statement mm. about whether, um, and do a generic, essentially a generic environmental impact statement on whether you can store um, uh, fuel, uh, spent fuel at, at uh, reactor sites or just generally, do we have the technology? Can we do this safely? And so we I decided, I heard all of this, and um, I decided to say, you know what, I know that the court kept a couple of the findings intact under this waste confidence finding, but I don't see this as being a good thing for the agency going forward. I think we're just going to be sued and sued and sued, and I think it's going to be hard for us because, oh, I forgot to tell you, um, the um, decision had been made to not go forward with Yucca Mountain at that time, mm. and they were doing the consent-based licensing. So that 
in light of that, the court was never going to accept this. You have confidence that there's going to be a waste disposal facility anytime in the future. Right. It rang so hollow it, at that point. It rang hollow. And so I knew we were going to be sued. So we completely changed the way that we were going to approach this. We did this generic environmental impact statement. And um, so that was the first sort of transformative thing that I worked on. Now I see why you got this job. So, yeah. So I, um, I think that that, along with some other things, um, I think gave the 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 chairman um, was the first to approach me about this job and but you can see this job being operational is very different than policy and uh, those the I in fact I I go to the general counsel's office when I have legal issues I go to the office of international programs when I have an international policy issues so. but you got tapped because you're willing to take on the hard problems you're willing to make decisions in spite of kind of a history and a trajectory going one way and make a turnaround which is kind of what people are talking about now the you know the agency needs to you know, rethink some, a, f a few things it needs to transform right coming back yeah, to transformation yeah, yeah. so um so tell us about that tell us about you know like taking on this role and right. one of the, some of the things that you want to accomplish with it as well yeah so so yeah so this was a you know this was a it was a big risk for me um i didn't i, I have to be honest um i had turn it down um, when it was first given to me. Because I thought, yes, I have to, you know, I'm just going to be honest. I, I turned it down because <laughs> I I love, I'm very nerdy. I like to read books and study and, you know, be the lawyer and you know, and, and I love policy. And and so I couldn't see, I couldn't picture myself in this job. And maybe if we have time, we can talk about, you know, how I go about risk taking. I kind of have a couple. Yeah, of, I want to hear this framework. Okay. So I have um, a couple things that I go through. And the first thing that I ask myself is, you know, do, do I, will this be good for what I consider things that are good for my heart? You know, mm. those things in my life that are really important, my children, my husband, traveling, these things that when I'm not working anymore, what am I going to do for the rest of eternity? You know, does this fit in with that? So, so that's the first thing. And, 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 it, and I'm getting toward the end of my career here. I, I'm eligible to retire. So I had to really think hard about, is this my next step or should I go outside and do something, you know, completely different? So that's where I was. So that came into it. Um, and I decided, you know, I could because I love, this is going to sound corny, but I, this is from the heart. I love this agency. I love the work. The mission resonates with me. It resonates with our staff. We do surveys and it's incredible. It resonates with our staff. So I said, you know, so yes, it, it, it's not a problem from that perspective. I want to make sure I keep a family life balance. But that was the first thing. The second thing I always ask myself is, am I going to be successful in the job? And I don't know if, I always ask this, I don't know if, um, is it a cultural thing? Is it um, being a woman? But, you know, I, I question myself in these jobs if I haven't done it before and it's going to be really different. So I talk to I have a lot of mentors and I mm. talk to them and say, why do you why do you see me being successful in this job? I, you know, I'm concerned that I don't have this or I don't have that. Can you help me think about these issues? And so I, that was another thing that I did. And I felt like, you know what, it, I, I saw myself as being successful in the transformation effort because I, I do. Um, care very deeply about the agency. And I thought that my enthusiasm for the mission would help us in our transformation effort. And I decided, you know, there's so many technical experts here. If I just am careful and listen to my technical F experts, I'm very confident that we're going to ensure health and safety and security. So I really went through these things in my mind. I was worried about a lawyer in this chief job when it had always been a nuclear expert. And then the other thing I always look at, is this a building block to what I want to do next in my mm. life? And and it was because it gave me a chance to be at this level of an organization and to do everything, you know, to have everything, all that responsibility. So if you were successful, you should be able to transform that to a different kind of organization, whether I, you know, go into, uh, you know, I don't know, save the children or, or, or some other organization for, for, um, something else that's completely different or if I stay in nuclear, you know, that would be a really good building block. Values, right? So mm -hmm. does this fit into my values? Excellence, right? Am I going to be great at it? Mm -hmm. And growth, that building block that you talked yeah. to. This is how you see problems. That's how I see problems, right. And how does that now apply to many of the challenges that you're taking on? What are some of the challenges that you're taking on to to help this in, to help to help this organization grow and, and move into the next era. Mm -hmm. You know, I had thank you for making that connection. <laughs> I hadn't really thought I, I hadn't really thought about it like that because I, I think about some of these personal choices of being so different. But you're right. Um, 
there is a connection and I guess, you know, um, but I, so some of the things that I, that have resonated with me, I've read, you know, a couple, you know, uh, I read as much as I could. I only had about two days when I finally accepted the job between getting into oh. the job. Oh yeah. So what changed your mind? Like, what was that thing that actually changed your mind? Was it one of your mentors? Yes. My mentors were, every mentor that I had told me, this is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at the issues in a, in a way that, um, you might be overthinking on which, you know, as a good attorney, I, I can overthink <laughs> any issue. Um, but so, you know, and so they, they helped me to see a different vision. But but I have to say, if it wasn't for Chairman Savinicki continuing to say, this is why you're going to be successful. This is what I'm trying to do. You know, I, I don't think I would have been motivated to step into the job. I had also talked to all four commissioners. I interviewed with them mm. at the time, all of the commissioners. And um, so I got the motivation through the interviewing, there were others that were interviewed as well, but I became more motivated, which is unusual. Sometimes you interview for a job and you think, I definitely don't want that job. But this was not the case here. It really yeah. motivated me. So, and when I went into the interviews, I still hadn't decided whether I would take it, <laughs> which is very, um, which is, doesn't sound right. Um, but I thought I would, but I thought, you know, the last second I could still pull out because this was the biggest risk I had taken, you know, yeah. reputational risk, really not risk that anything was going to happen at the plants. So there were so many great people working here. So it's reputational. Right. Then you throw it out there, right? You're like, if you're a good person and you stick close to your values. So that's what I did. I decided, you know, I was going to get into this job and I, I was going to make sure that we I, I had a lot of mentees who were telling me that they didn't understand where we were transforming to. They felt mm. like we were like just running in all these different directions. They needed, they were really asking for someone to put it together and build a path. That was the first thing. The second thing was they, they were telling me, you know, they were really worried that we were transforming to just be complicit with industry. Mm. That industry was having economic difficulty, which it is. And they were coming in with new ways of doing things. They were reinventing themselves. But in their mind, we were going to let them do things without being really committed to our mission. So um, when I came in, and then the last thing was um, just a lack of communication, a, a real inability for people to understand because the communication efforts weren't um, in a way that people were understanding. They were... the. The executives, I was one of the executives, we were working very hard on all of these issues, but we didn't have solutions. So mm. now all of these things were, you know, come on my lap. Um, so so, so how I, did you make it more clear, mm -hmm. you know, in, in light of, you know, people being confused around where it's going to go? What did you do? So I, um, so luckily there's such great people that work here. And I worked with Rob Lewis, who was in this office and he's an executive, a senior executive. And he helped me put together a communication package. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to first thing, create a, create a path. And what I did is I said, okay, I want to first concentrate on our mission. Next decision-making mm. because everything I was trying to read had to do with private organizations and they look at their products and they either spin them off because they're not helping them or they really concentrate on that product. Our product was decision-making and we had already been discussing decision-making. So I said, well, our decision-making has to be modernized, right? So modern decision-making and then, um, and then communicating that decision and communicating the path. So communication became a key. So what Rob helped me do, have you ever heard of SOAPS? SOAPS. Oh, so this is an acronym, S or O A P S. And what they are is strategy on a page. Okay. And so what you do is you set out where to do a good assessment of the agency, where it is, look at where you want to go. Mm. And then you put in concrete things that you're going to do to, to achieve it. And so I work with the executives. We did it in a very, very hastily, you know, as fast as we could. And I said, okay, we're going to do three soaps, one for sticking with our mission. Mm. And, you know, the thing that struggle that we struggle with with our mission is what makes us, what helps us is that we have flexibility on what is adequate protection. We have the expertise. We have, I think, the world's greatest experts in, in, in these fields. Um, at least among the world's greatest experts. And so you can make a decision, but it's not to zero risk, right? Mm. It's it's adequate protection. It's it's um, maintaining uh, public health and safety. It's it's reasonable assurance of adequate protection. And that's that's really hard for us. Right, because one of the things, if you drive too far to zero risk, you might inadvertently create risk elsewhere, right? Because the, the least risky system is one that doesn't exist, Right. But if you were to say, let's eliminate all risk in the nuclear industry and shut all plants down, well, then we'd actually be introducing risk into other people's lives in other ways because they need to get their energy sources from 
more risky and less safe and more pollutant uh, sources. So there's that balance to make and that's that's the tricky part right yeah and it's even trickier for us because we can't be we can't be associated with a promotional at all so right. the decision of whether to do you leave something that to or me not, i'll take care yeah, of that you, you take care of that <laughs> in the industry but so but that's an interesting nuance right because yeah. it, it actually puts our decision making in a box so our decision is you decided you industry you decided you wanted to do this and mm-hmm. and and it that's right everything looks at it as as a, a, a benefit like even the the non-proliferation treaty, right? It's about peaceful uses of nuclear power. So so the US might set a policy that this is a good thing and also there's an industry that is is working in this area. So there's a decision to to make these changes and when you go to zero risk, the real problem with going to zero risk is that you become paralyzed mm-hmm. because you never know where to stop. That's the first thing. And you're you become so risk adverse that you can't make good decisions. You're kind of, it's it's, it's um, analysis paralysis. Yes, and it happens. That is a real thing because you're you're so risk adverse that you're it's analysis paralysis. You can't make a good decision. And here's the thing: a lot of the things that the that the industry wants to do is modernizing. So they want to put in, for example, digital INC, which will actually make they're arguing would make them safer. Right. And we have modeling that yes, this would make them safer. Well, if you can't look beyond the cyber threats and things like that to make a good decision, then they can't take advantage of that technology that would actually make them safer. Mm. So you realize that going to zero risk can actually take away from your ability to make sure we're focused on the most risk significant issues. Got it. So how do you... That's the issue. So, okay. So you got your soaps and how do you, what do you do? You just lay down a page and you pass it around or you pull people into offices and say, we're going to teach you the soap or what do you do? So you'll never believe it. So I'm thinking, now we have our path. We're just going to all run toward it, right? And all together. (laughs) No, the staff gets it and goes, no, Margie, did you give us another initiative? I said, no, no, believe me. It's not another initiative. This is a tool. It's a tool that we're going to use. This is the path we're on. And, And when you look Look at what we've set out as where we're going to go. It should look really positive and a good place to be. So first, so so mainly what I've been doing is just trying to generate interest, you know, generate a, a cohesive team toward, you know, working toward the goals that are that are in the soaps. So we're doing it through a number of different things. Some of it is education, mm-hmm. um, providing yeah, some of the things we had initiatives that were already underway. Um, like for example, we were doing strategic workforce planning, which is looking at. It's a, it's a multi-level um, look at our uh, workforce so that we can make sure that we retain and, and recruit um, uh, the best and the brightest, continue to, to re- retain and recruit the best and the brightest. But it's a um, multi-step effort to, to find where you have gaps and mm. skills for the future. And so, um, and then what we're trying to do is we're trying to put in place some um, solutions so that we can have, um, we have learning transformation that we're considering. We're looking at the qualifications and whether we go too far with that. And so we're looking at a number of different things. So anyway, that's what we did. We put the soaps in place, but we looked at in order for us to get to that place where we want to be, what do we have to do? Some of it was look at our old guidance, look at our old procedures, change those because maybe they're not, um, they're binding us so tight and and they were based on um, you know, last century's technologies, right? right? And and last century thinking, right? Maybe five decades ago. And so some of it is that. Some of it's looking at the procedures and putting in place good guides. And and so the first questions the staff asked, I know it's working because they're saying, well, what does risk informed really mean? Like, how do you take risk insights into consideration? Mm. What do you really mean by that? What does adequate protection really mean? How do we do that? How do we do this well? They're asking incredible questions. So we're trying mm. to come up with tools and processes for us to work through these hard issues. So uh, the next thing that I realized, so we, so we have things going on with the workforce. We have things that we're doing that are actually with the decision-making. We're putting in place a number of different um, technological. We're taking advantage of, actually, it's current technology. It's not even really advanced, but we're taking advantage of it to make sure that, that we can expedite decision-making using these good tools that are out there. So those are some of the things that we're doing to, to get to modern decision-making. Um, and then some of the issues, though, have to do with uh, just people wanting to be, um, you know, a part of the effort. You know, some people don't want to change. Mm. You know, that's not in their nature. Change. Well, so is how hard. do you how do you deal with that one? That's a people problem. That's hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a people problem. You know what I do? I, and this is really true. I, I try to put myself in the, when I was that staffer. You yeah. know, when I was down at my what, like maybe the, the lowest level of the agency that I, I came in. And try to ask myself, like, what would I have been? Would I have been like yeah. the change agent, or would I have been 
the person who, in this circumstance, or the person who was kind of questioning and cynical and saying, prove it, prove it, prove it, you know? So I try to put myself into that, and I can see myself in a lot of different areas. And then I say, what would have convinced me? So that's the first thing I do. I have mentees at all different places in the agency. I listen. I say that. Empathy builds, once again, back to empathy. This is your your powerful tool. This is how you use to affect change. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that is. It's important to me, that's for sure. Um, Okay, so... What now? You know, as we wrap up here, I'd just love to get kind of your overall impression of, you know, where the industry is going, you know, what you would like to see the world looking like 5, 10, and 15 years from now. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I um, that we did is we put this future assessment in place, and I don't know if you've had an opportunity to look at it, but it is so exciting. It ta- It has four different scenarios, some of which are nuclear gone with the wind, you know, it doesn't go anywhere, but others are nuclear takes off where we have small modular reactors and all kinds of different that are not just light water, but, but new technologies. So there are all these different scenarios. So now we're working on um, getting our staff motivated in a way that we could be successful no matter what scenario we're in awesome. and that the scenarios aren't defined by what we do. We, we're just a good regulator and wherever the industry goes or the U.S. policies go, we can, we can adapt. And so that's and so exciting, right? Because you know that this isn't a prediction, right? No one of these scenarios is going to be the way. And, and they were meant to be. They're kind of fanciful. So they were meant to be, to stretch our thinking. So that's where I see the agency going. Is our next thing, big thing that we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on those four scenarios and think about what would make us successful in any one of those. So as we continue to transform, and I, I do say this, and, and I should make this a point because I think I've heard a lot about a lot of feedback, but I say, you know, we're going to make it, dis- we're going to transform one decision at a time. And it's mm. because this agency, we do have a lot of people who are so, you know, we, a lot of us are type A and we're trying to do too much. So um, one thing that I say is that we're going to transform one decision at a time. We, we, we know that it's urgent that we do it because we're on, we're on a, a turning point. This sort of luck thing that you were talking about, we're at a turning point because all of these new reactors that are possibly down the road, it's very exciting, but it ta- we have to train our workforce. We have to encourage our staff to learn, take those risks that I took, you know, go into a whole new field. You're gonna learn, you, you work with light water technology, go and look at, you know, molten salt, get the training, be the one to, 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 to have that expertise and bring the agency forward when it's trying to regulate. So that's the exciting, that's next. So, and, and we're doing, we're going to do a jam. Are you familiar with jams? Mm. So the agency is going to do a jam where we're going to be on for a couple of days talking to our staff. I'm going to be on part of the time and we're going to talk and, and figure out like what are those one or two things that'll make us successful no matter what scenario we're in. And I'm hoping some really good things come out of it and that'll be some of the things that we go forward working on. So I'd say that's what's next. Margie Doan, thank you so much. You're welcome.